Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to Mondays with Mr. Happy, aka Mr. Happy Mondays, the weekly Q&A show where you ask me questions and I answer them. Again, apologies for the insane lack of content this month, but honestly, as much as I've said a bunch of other reasons as to why there probably wouldn't be a lot of content, I have just been putting a lot off while I've been playing Devil May Cry 5 as well. Even the review I wanted to make for Devil May Cry 5, which I've recorded and now I'm going to re-record since I platinumed the game on PS4, um, it has been consuming my time. I'm just in love with the game. And I remember saying that last week, so I'm not going to get you caught up. But I'm tired. I'm addicted to Devil May Cry 5, even having 100% of the title at this point. And I'm really looking forward to the free DLC for Bloody Pals for that on April 1st. But... This Monday, so Mr. Happy, as a reminder, I am going to be attending the JP Fan Fest this coming weekend. It's going to be the 22nd and 23rd here in the States. It will be the 23rd and the 24th over in Japan. And as such, this coming weekend and the next week or so, we'll produce a ton of content on the channel. Probably get back into... Uh, a more regular schedule, uh, especially with a bunch of other titles coming out. Sekiro is coming out, Chocobo Dungeons coming out, Episode Arden for Final Fantasy 15 is coming out, Patch 4.56 should be coming for Final Fantasy 14, which hopefully is including the Yojimbo trial as well, which I've gotten to experience at the North American Fan Festival already. We have the Bloody Palace free DLC for Devil May Cry 5. Um, April's supposed to have the 14-15 collaboration, so... Uh, lots of lots of crazy stuff is are about is about to be coming down the pipeline. So I'm really excited. I'm in such a good mood today. That I'm really looking forward to answering these questions for the weekly Q and A. Before we do that, we do of course have to thank our Patreon sponsors. We do it every week, and I probably should have pulled the list up before I started recording. But you know, I like to uh, keep my uh, lack of professionalism in my videos so that you guys can make fun of me for it later. Um, besides, I already know the first two people that started off to buy myself some time while I pull up the list. We have our patrons of light. Kuja Cross on Genova and Kurenai Oni, who I will put images for on the screen. Kurenai providing a picture of his cat, which is cute. So as a cat owner, I do definitely appreciate that. But thank you to those two for going above and beyond with their support. I've appreciated it vastly over the last year or so. And you guys are awesome. So thank you. Thank you. And with thanking my patrons of light, I bought enough time to get the rest of my list up. So uh, we, of course, have a ton of other patrons. Uh, not patrons. Of light. Well, yes, a ton of other patrons, but not a ton of other patrons of light, which is what I almost accidentally said that saved it. Of course, we have our standard sponsors over on Patreon. We have uh, Kromgar Holzborgsen of Gilgamesh, Kevin, Wabatalia, Alma Elma, Dark Lumina from Genova, Marianne, Ramil, Gaming, Savile, Empire, Mizra, Red Wings of the Baron FC from Zolera, Sidus, Oreo, and Shiva, Sid Helmand of Gilgamesh, Afro Ninja from Malboro, Cheesecat from Leviathan, That Lame Weave, Ashenomi of Cerberus, Fafarian, Rendell, Stevie Rex, and Neon. We have our elite sponsors. We have Itsumi, Amarillo of Gilgamesh, Ravik, Card Drakens from Fanfrit, Sigurd Drig from Balmung, Edge Pharaoh Ultros, Jerrica, Emma, Nyrak of Clan Vizsla, Chris Uzuki, Crazy Demeter from Midgar, <sighs> Rajin Ventanis from Cactar, Carol, Ray, Sanji, Shadow Link on the Tonberry server, Dom, Asuka Wake from Genova, Lamillionel of Maker, Summer, Son of the Fennel Family, Johnny Yatsia, Kifkin the Great Eagles on Exodus, Katayoshi from Kujata, Skin Symphony from Ragnarok, Randlander, West Austin, Purple Warrior, Nedric Red Seal on Exodus, Lexi Valentine, Matar and the Revivus of Seed from Zodiac, Sour Cream and Chives from Genova, Renault, Chikar, Goisha Balfour of Siren, Phoenix Down FC on Goblin, and Saren from Zodiac. Finally, we have our premium sponsors. We have Babatiyama from Diablo, Shadow Aria, Bryn Hilder, Zeravire of Coral, Alchemy, Shanka, Casual Heroes FC on Maker, Summer, to touch. Talk on Hyperion, Kane Uzuki from Genova, U Star Lanka World, Sothal, Sarah Frost from Behemoth, Holy Tabasco, Crass 015, Shiny FC on Ultras, Cat Kazuma, Ignis Fragrant from Excalibur, Lester of Fanfret, Not Quarters from Excalibur, Krovos Moonscar, Private Mikey, Not in Sami, Rudy Rudiger, Kill Hackman, Raw Jr., and Kill Tastic Jones. So thank you to all of you for supporting, especially on a content free month on the YouTube channel, because that is the primary reason for supporting. So the fact that you guys are supporting on a relatively content dry month, it means a lot to me. We will have plenty coming down the line. Obviously, we've got months leading up to Shadowbringers, plus a ton of plus a ton of other stuff besides i am working on a few extra devil may cry 5 videos that i hadn't originally intended to work on some of them are going to be uploads of specific levels speaking about getting s ranks on specific stages that people might struggle with as i think that'll be pretty useful information for anyone else going for the platinum trophy anyway um i haven't looked at the youtube questions yet so let's get started all right we have our first question here from dalmore hey there first time asker save a bonus of Hmm, how about a pile of grade 7 material when Shadowbringers releases? Yeah, I hope with all that material transmu uh, transmutation. Anyway, when the 2.0 closed beta first went live, the content was much harder. Level 15 Gargoyle provided a decent challenge to players. I was talking about this the other day on stream. Some classes need to use antidotes in order to pass it, and you got some from the quest prior, so it worked out pretty well. Players reached out to the community to seek guidance for the challenging fight before it was heavily nerfed in the next beta. My question is, with the upcoming introduction of New Game Plus, could there be any possibility to introduce a more challenging version of the main scenario quests in New Game Plus as optional content, of course? So New Game Plus seems to mostly be a 
tool for uh, re redoing the main scenario quest and not so much for additional challenge. It's not that it couldn't be used for that, but as far as we know, they are scaling the missions during New Game Plus to match your level. Now, that doesn't mean they're making it more challenging. That means that if you do it as a level 70, you should feel about approximately the same as you did when you did it at the required level the first time around. Um, they could do it. I don't think they will. I think the, the primary idea is to go back and do it again instead of making a whole new character or just going to the in room in order to re-experience um, main scenario content. So no, I don't think they're gonna do that. I'd totally be open to the idea. You know, I'm always down for more options in regards to challenging content, but it just doesn't seem to be the goal with New Game Plus. Next question. Hey Haps, hope you're doing well and you ha when you have, or depending on timing, are having an amazing time in Japan. It took me a second to get that, like to read it. I don't know what was wrong. Uh, regarding two aspects, the first being raids and the second being story, what is your worst case? Uh, I feel like this is missing dial. This is missing text. Because I remember, I feel like I remember scrolling through this and there's like text that's not showing. Um, I'm going to assume you mean... Um, I guess like what would be things that I, I wouldn't enjoy with those two aspects. Um, I think Omega and 4.X is kind of my worst case scenario in regards to both of those things. Um, the raids just, the boss, some of the bosses were fun, don't get me wrong. Uh, I thought it was a very well balanced raid, especially its general progression patch by patch through Delta, Sigma and Alpha Scape. But that being said, um, the story was very unsatisfactory for me overall. Um, I, I thought that the raid boss was having little to no relevance up until we got really close to the end. It was kind of a disappointing aspect. And I'd like to see them revisit uh, what kind of an acceptable raid series could look like. Um, as for the main scenario, because I'm assuming you also mean that, uh, I don't think there is a worst case scenario. As long as we have some strong characters in the front line, um, it, and Lise was not a very strong character uh, throughout the beginning of Stormblood. Luckily, 4.1 through 4.5 thus far has been really good in terms of story patches, teaching us a lot of things that we've had a lot of questions about, and still leaving an adequate number of mysteries. I just hope they kind of continue down that line. The thing I'll be keeping my eye on the most is Yorha, because it's such an it's such an unusual thing to do to make a 24 man based on near automata in particular. Um, and it's going to take a very careful execution for it to not feel really out of place in Final Fantasy 14. So that's the thing that I am uh, paying attention. And that could be my worst case scenario uh, if that doesn't go well. All right, the next question uh, from Ambrose Piambo. Hey, Haps, any reason you cannot queue for multiple duty roulettes at one time? It seems like it would be helpful to queue for all of the duty roulettes, 50 to 60, 70 dungeons, main scenario, and join whichever pops first, and then queue for the remaining ones after you're done. Enjoy your content and keep it up. So from a technical standpoint, I'm sure there's some sort of back-end issue in regards to queuing up for multiple types of roulettes in particular. Um, I'd have to imagine that... It, there's probably a good reason why they do not allow it. Um, it probably has to do with the consistency of the number of people going through a roulette. But the fact that they let you do it with individual dungeons and let you take whichever pops first, it kind of makes sense that you then also be able to do it with your roulettes. So there has to be something we're not seeing or not hearing about that leads that, or they want it to be so that when people have an accurate idea of how long they'll be waiting specifically for roulette, they, I guess they might want a better idea of what people are uh, looking for. Now, if I'm not mistaken, no, I, I think I am mistaken. I, I was thinking, I think you can only queue, you know what, this actually might be the reason. So I'm wondering, I'm trying to remember because it's been a while since I've queued for multiple instances. Um, I don't remember if you can queue for instances that are different, that require different numbers of people simultaneously, like queue for some four-man stuff and some eight-man stuff and whichever pops first. I feel like you can, but th that would have been the only thing that I would have said. So if you can do that, then that throws that out the window as well. Um, no, actually, now I'm kind of curious why uh, why we can't do that, what the actual like answer is. I don't think they've ever provided one, so I don't have a good answer for this. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll poke Yoshi P about it when I'm in Japan. All right, next one. Hi, Mr. Happy. First time asking a question, and the bonus can be a whole day of sushi for you and your girlfriend. First of all, thank you for including my girlfriend in that and not just for me. I don't see many people actually do that for their wish, so I appreciate that. Thank you. My question is this. I recently watched a video that Shadowbringers is going to be the last expansion for MSQ because of who would say such a stupid thing? <laughs> I'm going to just outright say it. Anyone saying Shadowbringers is the last expansion for MSQ is saying a very dumb thing. Um, because no. 
<laughs> the answer is pretty, pretty, pretty much no. Um, they're not gonna release an expansion. Be like, by the way, there's no story for this expansion. What the fuck kind of thing is that? <laughs> no, there, of course there's going to continue to be a main scenario. Some people might have suspected that also because Shadowbringers is talking a lot about one of our major uh, story arcs a lot more, and that of Zodiac. Um, but it's been explicitly said for years now that at some point the Zodiac storyline will come to an end, and that we will continue into a new storyline after that. Whether or not Shadowbringers ends it or just brings it forward a lot more is a question that uh, obviously still needs to be answered, but no, we're not going to be done with main scenario quests until we reach a point like Final Fantasy XI where that's it, game's done, there's not enough people playing, we can't produce more main scenario quests. So no, look, please look forward to more main scenario quests after 5.0. And on to the next one. Hey, Haps, this is my first time asking you a question for Monday, so Mr. Happy, so I have a bonus question. <laughs> well, thanks, I guess. <laughs> Which MMO outside of 14 have you enjoyed the most and looking forward to more content? World of Warcraft is always my second choice. Final Fantasy XI's um, actually been on a bit of a surge on the live servers in particular. Um, they've been doing a lot more uh, in the, regards to their monthly updates. They've had a lot more plans going forward, a lot more character progression, a lot more gear choices. Uh, so Final Fantasy XI's been doing pretty good, but I am looking forward to Final Fantasy XI Mobile. Who the fuck knows when that'll come out at this rate. But uh, yeah, no, those, those, are, those are two that I would name off the top of my head. I gotta give a shout out to Elder Scrolls though. Because uh, Elder Scrolls has done some pretty good work over the last few years. Ever since one, excuse me, one Tamriel, uh, one Tamriel, it's gotten uh, better and better. And I've had uh, the feeling of going back, but then I played Morrowind, and Morrowind was kind of eh. Uh, specifically, the Morrowind expansion for Elder Scrolls, eh, it was kind of, it wasn't as good as I guess it felt like the rest of their content progression had been going. Um, Pantheon, I played somewhat recently, super old school. Uh, probably wouldn't make it like a main MMO, but I'm definitely interested in it in regards to seeing how it evolves since it is going for a very old school feel. Um, not like not like Wildstar did, but like in a different kind of way, specifically looking for, um, you know, not feeding you all the information you need and just requiring cooperation, um, slower combat pace, uh, things like that. So I'm curious to see how that'll pan out. Um, I've heard Albion, which is a game I did some sponsored content for, has, uh, despite its popularity just completely driving down, um, has actually leveled out and gotten a lot better too. So there's all sorts of things that I'm paying attention to in the MMO space. Uh, Ashes is another one. Uh, Chronicles of Illyria, I was a backer for that. So I'm curious to see how that pans out. Uh, tons and tons of stuff. For my, for my other question, I know you wanted more difficult four-man content like Mythic Plus for a while. I wanted to ask about four-man four -man content we do actually have in the game, Rathalos Extreme. Do you think that fight was implemented well? And what other games do you think could have a chance of getting a fight that would actually fit in Final Fantasy XIV? for like a four-man hard mode, excluding Nier, which is getting the Alliance raid. I think Rathalos was pretty well done. I think content like that kind of goes underappreciated because it is different. It is offering something we really don't have in the game. I mean, you have to appreciate that Rathalos is a pretty solid attempt at a more difficult piece of four-man content. Now, is it really extreme? It is in a, in a similar sense to the way Baldassian Arsenal is a raid. You know, uh, the rule set is different enough that players have to kind of step outside of their comfort zone and pick up a new skill or pick up a new uh, set of skills to handle and encounter a specific way. You know, Rathalos about the constant dodging, about watching your potion usage, about focusing on, uh, you know, your shielding so you can prevent a lot of damage that you can't heal up after the damage, um, making sure you don't die so that you actually, uh, you know, don't have to ha have any concerns about potentially failing the encounter. So those different rule sets and four-man content is kind of what I'm looking for. And Rathalos, I think, definitely delivers on that. I'd like to see public dungeons be done um, with four-man, uh, four to eight-man party sizes in the future. So that way we can have that sort of different feel in lower-man content. Uh, but four-man, I would love to see, like the caves and the diadem. I think I've brought this up in the last couple of weeks. The caves and the diadem that, you know, prevent you from flying, if those just acted like public dungeons maybe you have to kill something just outside in order to enter uh, with your group of four people um and then once you get inside they turn off the reses there's a couple of bosses some trash stuff like that could work really well i feel um at least better than the 56 man catastrophe that is trying to enter the baldessian arsenal through all the portals and stuff like that uh I, just making it a little bit more straightforward and a little bit less uh i guess rng whether or not you get in or get in in the way that you want to get in just I, I feel like they could they could narrow that down and do a lot more four-man content but i'm not so confident that they will 
Next question. Hi, Mr. Happy. First time asker, so I'll give a bonus of Tayaki for when you go to Japan. It's a fish shaped pancake. Oh, I know what Tayaki is. I've, I've had it here in uh, California, especially in LA. I've been to a lot of uh, Japanese food markets and had that before. And when I see the word pancake, I can't help but think about Persona 5. Pancakes? Uh, I just have one question today and I'll keep it short. It's a lot of text for keeping it short. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, don't worry. Uh, I've been a healer rain since I started this game back in the Realm of Born. I played all the healing classes, but Scholar's my main. That being said, I noticed every healer duplicate pair like White Mage plus White Mage or Astro plus Astro can work together in 8-man dungeons pretty smoothly. All except when you have two Scholars on the party. This is extremely frustrating as I feel two Scholars use their uh, use to their role use skills, mainly Sucker, at the exact same time. Thus, one of them is constantly wasting mana because your shields don't stack. You could argue that one Scholar could be assigned to Emergency, which is where I was going to go with that. But this doesn't seem very practical. Why do you think Scranix has waited so long to fix this? So I actually think Scholar Scholar works fine because the majority of healing done nowadays is not done directly through spells such as sucker it's done through off global cooldown abilities such as indom or uh things such as xcog on the tanks which can be alternated um and as you said emergency tactics being a relatively low cooldown um i the only time where it really becomes problematic is situations where you need a lot a lot of aoe healing constantly in which case you know two scholars might need to alternate between sucker emergency tactic sucker and then swapping who's responsible but you could also just do well-timed indoms and it would probably accomplish the same thing i think that it is definitely the least practical of the combinations but white mage plus white mage is also pretty rough in any serious eight-man content because you lack any party shields you pretty much need a paladin and a warrior to start covering those in place of you because they just don't have any good options on that and party shields are a really important part of making it through some of the tougher eight-man raids I, i'd argue scholar scholar while it may seem not that practical might work better than white mage white mage it also means double the chain stratagem which is uh, not so crazy a thing because you still have to kind of line it up with um with raid cooldowns but at least you have two separate sets so if you have some people who you know their raid cooldowns activate on the minute you know you can make sure you have one person assigned to that you have some someone who could be assigned to doing uh chain stratagems during major burst combos like a boss returning after a giant room wide aoe uh after like their halfway mark kind of thing i think scholar scholar works fine i think it just requires a little bit more thinking um and there's not really anything to fix there just require i would say in pugs it's probably the toughest to pull off combination you really have to discuss it beforehand but uh i i think it would do just fine to be honest all right on to the next one hi mr happy thanks for answering previous questions and giving me the confidence to continue with my content creation journey of course everyone it's it's always tough to gain confidence in that kind of stuff and sometimes you do need somebody else to perk you up with that but as long as you are someone who is committed and has ideas that you really want to get on paper you really want to get in video format or audio format or whatever then you really should just go for it because the worst thing that could happen is maybe you're not satisfied with the end result and you have to go back and reevaluate how you want to approach those kind of things Anyway, two quick questions for you today. I'm currently using Adobe Premiere and After Effects, which are two great programs that are, are excellent to use for videos. Um, we kind of wish I, I would kind of dive into After Effects and maybe Premiere just because they're both Adobe, so it's easy to work together with both. Um, do you have any alternate suggestions for video creation that's easy to use? Um, easy to use Sony Vegas is pretty easy. Um, I tried Premiere for a little bit and Vegas just does some things a little bit more self-explanatory, but if you are capable of uh, giving yourself the time to learn Premiere, uh, it has a lot of great functionality, can do pretty much all the same things, it's just maybe not as uh, beginner-friendly as Sony Vegas is. So that would be my recommendation. There's a few things you'd probably have to Google to get Sony Vegas working properly, depending on what kind of uh, machine that you actually have. But uh, that's a solid one. It's what I've used for years. And, uh, you know, outside of just wanting to try something different, I don't really see much of a reason to change it. Uh, secondly, I can't, con uh, I can't find confirmation anywhere or anyway, so apologies if this is easy to find, but will Koji be on stage at the JP FanFest like he was for NAEU doing live translations? And if not, what will be the best way to keep up what is being discussed as it'll be 2 a.m. in the UK and a recap video is already going to be fun at that time. So everyone's been telling me, and I haven't actually looked at the Lodestone the past couple of weeks uh, because I've been focused on other stuff, um, that there is going to be a second live stream on Twitch um, alongside the first one that is going to have English translations for what is available. Actually, you know what? Might as well just go to the Lodestone and see if I can find it real quick. Um, so that way I have a source on that. Uh, let's see. Join us at PAX East, the Wolves Den, Wolves Den Episode 9 Winners, um, Shadowbringers Pre-Order, Letter from the Producer Live at the Tokyo Fan Festival. Uh, let's see. The Square Enix Twitch channel will feature English language coverage of the show at the same time. 
please note that it will not be a direct translation. This means they probably have a script to read from. Now, it specifically says that for the live letter, but it also says coverage of the show. You'd have to assume the opening keynote is also going to be present there. So uh, if you go on Twitch, I don't have a, a hyperlink for you. Oh, no, wait, no, there actually is an English language cover. So if you go to the Lodestone and go to Letter from the Producer Live Part L at the Tokyo Fan Festival, there's literally a, a link that says English language coverage. So uh, yes, there will be some English uh, available. I, I actually, I had read this and just missed that part. I don't know how, um, but yeah, so there will be, don't worry, you'll be able to get all the information. And on top of that, even when they do Japanese only, all the slides are in English or they have English on them. So you would have been fine either way. And on to the next one. Hey, Mr. Happy. Hi. Uh, is there any chance you're able to, that you are able to ask at FanFest about giving Steam users options to buy Windows license keys with the recent load zone changes, adding more limitations to the Steam game? Thanks for all the videos in the past and the future. Kona. So um, there's been a lot of, I guess, kind of misunderstanding about what's happening with that. So for those who don't know or don't play on Steam, um, recently there were changes to the way that Final Fantasy XIV is handled on Steam. Now, previously, even if you bought the game on Steam, you were playing it through Steam, you were actually able to launch the Final Fantasy XIV launcher separately from Steam, so that way you didn't have to go through Steam's launch process or anything like that, which can be a little more convoluted, especially for an MMO. Um, it was changed so that you have to launch the game through Steam, and this is because of a policy that Steam has that they have not been asking Final Fantasy XIV, up to this point at the very least, in order to make good on. Steam forces you to launch through Steam, at least they try to force you to do it, um, so that way you can't activate any cheating software or stuff like that, or any piracy. Um, it's really all for those reasons, and up until this point, you know, Final Fantasy XIV was scot-free. They're basically just falling in line with Steam's requirements because it appears that Steam is being a little bit more strict with Final Fantasy XIV at the time. So, the easiest way to answer this question is, I could ask, it would be meaningless. If you're purchasing the game on Steam, you own a Steam license. That's the whole point of buying it through Steam. Um, they're not going to be, they're probably not going to develop an entire system to allow you to change from a Steam license key to a Windows license key. When the game is fully functional on both platforms, you could just no longer launch it indirectly uh, from the folder as opposed to the Steam launcher itself. So it wouldn't matter if I asked, in all honesty, because they're, it's not going to happen. It's The game is still fully functional. It's just people don't like the extra added clunkiness of going through the actual Steam launcher versus that subfolder launcher. On to the next one. Question! Hello. Oh, you do. You do say hi to me. I just read it as I was about to say, oh, hello to you too. Then I saw, no, wait, they say hey. Hey, Mr. Happy, a short, simple question this week, but do you know when the loot limit on the monastery will lift? If I remember correctly, the last raid of the last expansion lifted before the expansion released, giving us a chance to finish gearing our classes. Yeah, this is also true of the, um, of the, what's it called? The token from uh, A12, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Omega 12 normal, the, the uh, crystalloid. That still needs to have its limit lifted, or Bone Monastery needs to have its limit lifted, and Savage needs to have its limit lifted. Um, those will all probably happen in 4.57 or 4.58. They could happen in 4.56. I wouldn't, you know, disbelieve that. Um, but that's the earliest. So March 26th would be the earliest possible day. If not by the end of April, all of those loot limits will probably lift. And you'll have a couple of months before uh, Shadowbringers comes out to actually get all that loot that you're looking for. Okay, so you guys have so many questions. I knew this was going to happen when we went back to YouTube, so apologies if I missed your question. Um, I am kind of start. I'm starting to screen the questions a little bit more as we get later into this recording, um, but I am still going to answer quite a few more questions. Just letting you guys know that in the middle of the video. So the next one here is, hey, Mr. Happy, long time watcher, first time asker, have a first time bonus of a foot long chicken teriyaki on white bread. This this is a person who knows who know who knows how to how to make me Mr. Happy. Anyway, I've been watching for a long time, but I can never think of a question that hasn't been asked or one that was worth your time. But I finally have a question that has never been asked before. How exciting. I'm excited. Anyway, my question is about new and future jobs. Uh, well, let's see if it's new. Let's, let's see if it's actually new then. Uh, when Heavensward came out, all three jobs were available in the new city. But for Stormblood, they were located in the old city states. I don't like how we have to go back to the old cities instead of the new ones. Do you think the new expansion jobs should be available in the new cities? I mean, there's a samurai guild in Kugane for crying out loud. So the reason they do this is not because um, they don't want to. The reason why the Stormblood jobs are available in the old city states is because they ran into an issue where people had to play all the way through to level 50 content, do all of these main scenario quests before they were even allowed to reach the NPCs to play a job that they had to go back to level 30 to play. Now, when it comes to Stormblood, as long as you own Stormblood and you reach that level 50 mark, you instantly gain access to those jobs so that you can continue the main scenario quest 
on these jobs that you may have been waiting to unlock. And that's very much the same case for Gunbreaker. Basically, as soon as you hit 60, if it was only available in the new cities, you realistically wouldn't be able to reach Gunbreaker until level 71 at the earliest, you know, 70 to 71 in, in that range. So they want to prevent that. They want people to be able to probably reach level 60 if they have Shadowbringers, immediately change to Gunbreaker, and then continue the main scenario from there. So while it would seem to make sense to put the um to put the jobs in the new cities their job quests kind of just take them there eventually so samurai eventually found their way into kugane for the continuation of its quest with the sekasugumi as we've mentioned as you've mentioned here with that samurai guild um and that's good because that's you know kind of the place where it feels like they belong most or where they would have been if you had to actually get to Stormblood to unlock them first. And they'll probably do the same with Gunbreaker, where 60 to 70 will be an introduction to the job, it'll establish what the job quests are kind of all about, and then from 70 to 80, we'll probably go to what would have been the intended location for Gunbreaker. Uh, and I think that's a fine way to do it, because it's, it's very user-friendly. So I don't suspect they'll ever go back to unlocking them in new city-states, whereas their story can simply take you to the new city-states. And let's answer another, hello, hello, first time asker, do you think whenever the PS5 comes out that they will do a free upgrade campaign and have the upgraded graphics for those PS5 players? Sounds like a no-brainer to me. And I think you're right. I think it is a no-brainer. They did it for PS3 to PS4, but they, if I remember correctly, no, yeah, so they did it from PS3 to PS4 when the campaign was first available, like when the PS4 version was first available, and then they did another one when they canceled service on the PS3. I think, I think it's a no-brainer too. I, I think it's incredibly, incredibly likely, but as you've said, we don't really know anything about the PlayStation 5 yet. So it's kind of thinking like really far into the future. I have no doubt that Final Fantasy XIV is already in development for the PS5. I'd be really shocked. We already know a bunch of companies have dev kits for the PlayStation 5. I would be very surprised if Square Enix was not one of them, and I'd be very surprised if they already weren't working on a PS5 version of Final Fantasy XIV. That would shock me if they weren't already working on that. So um, yeah, no, I think you're right. It's a no-brainer, I think they'll do it. Next question, by the way, I was scrolling through the questions and I was like, what the fuck is that fan in the back? I just forgot, I, sh I meant to turn my PS4 off before recording this, but on Devil May Cry 5, I'm actually working on filling out the total results screen. Um, when you get the S rank on every mission for that platinum, you don't technically have to do it with every character. So there's some missions where you can pick multiple characters. I'm filling that out so it looks nice. I left the friggin' PS4 on, so the fan has been in this whole video again. It, next week, I don't know what it'll be like next week, because I'm going to be in Japan, so I have no idea what Mondays is going to look like next week. But uh, there will not be a PS4 fan in the future ones, I promise. And if I do, call me on it. Anyway, next question. Uh, greets. Greets to you too. Let's get down to brass tacks and keep this one brief, eh? I'm down for it. Canadian. Cool. Regardless of Final Fantasy XIV viability, what's your favorite 14, What's your favorite Final Fantasy job that's only made a single appearance in any game or spin-off game? Bonus points, you pick something that doesn't have a mechanical thematic peer. So you can exclude things like Gun Major Vampire from Bravely Default or Eleven's Corsair Astrologian Lady Luck from Ten Two. For the record, I'd like to roll with the uh, Final Fantasy Tactics Mediator slash Orator. I know the job blows chunks, but I conceptually like the idea of a classic D&D face where you can talk your way out of a bad situation as well as potentially recruit your enemies. Um, Puppet Master is probably the go-to. Puppet Master, as far as I know, has really only made its appearance in Final Fantasy XI. Um, while the concept has technically been presented in other Final Fantasies, it's never been playable, it's never really been something that you have to interact with in combat. Uh, and so Final Fantasy XI's Puppet Master is an easy, easy choice for me. So much so that I was actually out to drinks with a few gaming buddies, and I met some new people while I was there. And one of them, you know, said, oh, you know, I played Final Fantasy XI, and I was like, hey, me too. And he's like, yo, what was your favorite job? I said, Puppet Master. He's like, fuck yeah. I never thought I'd randomly meet someone at a bar and talk about Puppet Master for the next 30 minutes. Oh, that was, it was, it was a good night. But anyway, yeah, Puppet Master is definitely top of the list. Um, even if it were to be implemented as a limited job, you know, Yoshi P in the past, prior to mentioning it as a potential limited job, had actually said they weren't even remotely considering the job. So <laughs> I'll take what I can get, I suppose. Besides Blue Mage, despite the fact that I don't really play it much anymore because I've completed all the content, it doesn't really, it doesn't, it's not really any different to me than any other job that I play personally. You know, when I'm done with content for it, I generally don't touch that job very often. So Blue Mage kind of fits into that same category, and at least I know I'll get direct content for that job at some point in the future. Puppet Master would probably be about the same lines. 
Also, Puppet Master got buffed in Final Fantasy XI recently, and I haven't had the time to go and actually look at it, but it seems like the buffs have been pretty good, so uh, I'm going to be taking a peek at that probably sometime in April. All right, and with that, we're going to make this the last question so I can get working on some other stuff uh, and also go eat dinner because I haven't really eaten in the past several hours. Uh, anyway, so, hey Haps, hello, little fight design question today. What are your views on the arenas for Trials and Raids, and do you think they should try and be a little bit more experimental with the design and layout, like Ozma, proto Ozma, Thunder God Sid, um, or maybe Suzaku, but I'm salty about the stage since I had to modify my Salted Earth macro for that fight specifically. You think there's a chance we may see an asymmetrical arena? So we've had arenas that are kind of different in the past. We had the turn five arena, the turn one arena, the turn two arena. A lot of those were very uh, unique. And I think there are some hit or miss ones. I think turn two is actually a really interesting example of a way to do an arena. Um, it's complicated for complication's sake, but it feels a lot more, I guess, natural considering it is, you know, what what uh, the coils are in the first place. Turn one, the arena really didn't add to the fight. It made, it made parts of it slightly more annoying, I suppose is the best way to say it. Um, and it, I don't really feel like it added much to the actual fight encounter. And turn five, it led to so many bugs and problems with that hill. And even to this day, the dip in the hand being used to completely kind of go around the dive bomb mechanic is... You still technically need to do it, but just it, it creates such an odd scenario that is... Uh, it, it just kind of shows you why they tend to stick to asymmetrical arenas... Uh, or what's it called, the, to symmetrical arenas in the first place. Most of the things you've listed are still symmetrical. They are either they're donuts of some sort of variation and whatnot. And I think it's fine to experiment, but symmetrical arenas make for really um, uniform fight design. Whereas asymmetrical arenas tend to lead to issues where there's clearly a side of the arena that's better. There's clearly uh, some sort of uh, malfunction in the way that mechanics interact with certain parts of the arena. So I don't really have any issue with symmetrical arenas. For me, it's a, it's, it's personally a kind of petty thing to worry about. Um, outside of the hope that maybe you get something that like, uh, it feels more like it's naturally occurring. It's not like those kind of things don't naturally occur, but to see them so often, it feels less natural in the first place. So, uh, I, I get that desire to have something that feels more like it belongs in the world and wasn't designed specifically for us to walk up and do it. But for me, it's such a minor thing that I don't really care which way they go with it. As long as a fight is designed well and the arena we're fighting on um, is conducive to whatever they're trying to do, I think I'm perfectly okay with anything. It just needs to be fun. That's really all that concerns me. It may not be the answer you were looking for, but it is my answer. Anyway, that's the last question we're going to be taking for Mondays with Mr. Happy this week. Thank you again to everyone. Uh, if you want to ask your questions, ask them in the YouTube comment section uh, below this video. And I, I don't know when I'm going to record the next Mondays. I don't know if I'll be doing it from Japan because I'll be relatively busy there. Uh, or if I'm going to wait till I come back and maybe post this, post the next one on like a Wednesday and just call it the weekly Q&A instead of Mondays. We'll, we'll see. But thank you everyone for asking your questions. Be sure to ask ones for next week as well. If I missed your question, apologies. Uh, just, you know, try again. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Just try again. So uh, anyway, I'm going to get going. I'm going to get working on my Devil May Cry 5 review and maybe some other videos on Devil May Cry 5 as well. So I will see all of you in the next video and keep an eye out because a lot of videos coming from the JP Fan Fest this coming weekend. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. And until then, take care.